uh, Psalm 51 in my mother's, in sin did my mother consume me. Uh, consume. She what? ate me. <laughs> what's the, what's the word? Conceive. In oh, sin man. In, in, in sin she did. ate me with the, man. Uh, cannibalism is a sin. I did not so. know you were going there. Just Can, like, cannibalism is a sin. Is so. cannibalism sin? He had a stepdaddy. He did. Joey. Joey. Not talked about a lot after Jesus' 12-year-old experience. Yeah. I think uh, he kind of dropped the ball and God, God got mad. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Second, after you let my boy go to the temple and you were gone for a few days, you left him there. And Jesus, like, Jesus even stuck it to him. He's like, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And did Jesus just fast for three days? Oh, I'm sure they had food in the temple. You're not supposed to eat the food in the temple. You know, around the temple. The same people that he whipped are probably the ones that fed him. <laughs> it's like, man, remember this kid was 12 years old and we gave him that sandwich 18, of, of 18 pita years and falafel? <laughs> and 18 just, years later, he's whipping them. It's like, I gave you a sandwich. Oh, man. And I think that that's kind of what you see in King David. King David was, dude, he was, I mean, he was like SEAL Team 1. Mm-hmm. Maybe on steroids. Yeah. I mean, he's sneaking into camps and cutting off people's foreskin. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Pondering the Pages with Pierce and Kyle. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Pondering the Pages with Pierce and Kyle. Hey, I'm Kyle. And I'm Pierce. So Welcome back. I had a realization this week. Oh, man. Those are always good. Dad jokes are kind of only funny when they're on the spot, not set up. When it's like somebody's quick wit, when it, but when it's set up, it's not really that funny. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes when you tell those, they just kind of go flat. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that only. I've noticed that also when I tell them. Yeah, I'm getting over a cold. I have uh, somebody at work was generous enough to share it with me on Tuesday, so Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Were you kissing on the mouth? No, he just. His mom never taught him to turn his head or, or cover his mouth when he coughed. And so he just he shared it with me. <laughs> but, oh, the germ theory. So I apologize for my my radio voice this week. But what you got? You got something? Nothing. It's Q&A, baby. You know, I, I had another realization this week. So you know how Seinfeld has an episode about everything? Like, it's really easy to... Oh, there's a Seinfeld episode about that. So funny. Shy Lynn has a song about everything. That's the Christian version. Shy Lynn has a song about that. Yeah, for us, especially. Yeah. It's He does have a song that usually hits on a point. Which uh, reminds me... So a few weeks ago, I talked about Shy Lynn and Beautiful Eulogy, and I was trying to describe the differences between them, and I thought of a, a really good way to do that. Shylin is Proverbs and Beautiful Eulogy is the Psalms. So Shylin is Limp Biscuit and Beautiful Eulogy is Corn. You're going to have to explain that one. Yeah, they're both pretty similar, but at the same time, same message. Okay. You had to listen to it. Yeah. I mean, I've heard Brian Welch was one of the singers, oh, maybe no. the lead singer of Corn. There was and a bunch of those bands that they came out with so many records, one after the other, just like they all sounded exactly the same. Well, uh, so there's a, I haven't seen them in a long time, but there's a ministry called I Am Second, I think is yeah. what it is. I know what you're talking about. And Brian, they just, they basically do interviews with mostly celebrities who are Christian and they huh. share their testimony. But Brian Welch, who I think was the lead singer of Corn or one of the guitar players or something, he he shared his testimony. Uh, he kind of hangs out with the Todd White crowd, I think, a little bit. But I won't hold that against him mm -hmm. too much. Thomas Terry, Faith, Hope, and Love. Didn't we talk about Faith, Hope, and Love recently? Maybe uh, we talked about faith mm -hmm. with it being the shield of faith. Yeah. So uh, Tom, of God. Thomas Terry, who, Odd Thomas from beautiful eulogy he's now a pastor i was listening to a sermon of his and he was talking about faith hope and love and he said faith hope and love these words have been watered down in today's church culture but these three words are multifaceted multi-directional and multi-dimensional 
Faith is directed towards God, love is directed towards one another, and hope is directed towards our future. Faith is rooted in the past, love deals with the present, and hope is realized in the future when Christ returns. These three virtues are one of the greatest evidences of regeneration. Regeneration causes faith, it enables us to love, and it gives us assurance of our future hope. Then he said, Do you want a matrix on whether the gospel is at work in your life? Look for evidence that your faith is producing work, and that your work is prompted by love, and that your love is being preserved, persevered, because you have a future hope. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. It's one of those things, too, the person has to be pretty introspective. Let's say that they have been justified. Fruit is not going to be produced overnight. No. But we as judgmental humans a lot of times are basing whether a person is justified solely on the evidence of fruit. We just do. Um, So I think that with that being said, in those early days of gardening, if you take the parable of the soils, in those early days, the person just has to stay at it until fruit is produced that's visible to the outside world. Because that's where it says God looks on the inside, man looks on the outside. That's in Scripture, so you can't erode it. And I think that even in Christian circles, a lot of times we look at the works that a person is doing and we judge whether a person is justified or not. But if there are no works at all, then it's a pretty clear indication that that person has not continued to cultivate the soil, the seeds of faith that were dropped in there, justification through sanctification. Seed of the word. Yeah. They're yeah. a hearer of the word, not a doer. Yeah. So it's a it's just kind of interesting. It's just like we do take a look though. It's mm-hmm. just like and we judge based on what we see. I think we're supposed to though. Scripture does call us to judge. It's you know, today you read judge not lest you be judged. But scripture does tell us to basically assess. Yeah. He used the, the I think I think the word judge is used, but it's what it's saying is assess. I think other. definitely, definitely in, when we're within Christian circles and a person is a professing Christian, yeah, definitely. But Jesus was not talking to professing Christians. When he said what? Judge not lest you be judged. Right. They were all Jews. Mm. So I think that if a person <clears throat> is a professing Christian, then I think it is our responsibility to hold them accountable to the scriptures that basically say this, this, and this, which are going to be the epistles in the New Testament. Yeah. But, I mean, he was on the Sermon of the Mount. There were... I mean, Mixed crowd. Oh, there weren't hardly any. There were people who, what? people who believed in him. You know, they followed him because of the signs and the miracles, but well, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Mixed crowd, there was probably Jews and non-Jews. Oh, yeah. Or do you think they're all Jews? I think mostly Jews because yeah. of where they were. Yeah, that's a good point. They were mostly Jews. Yeah. Uh, Jews that were probably even ostracized by Judaism Mm -hmm. because of their uncleanliness or because they were wine drinkers or this or that. So I think that most of them were Jews probably. I mean, where the Sermon on the Mount took place, Matthew 6, it would have been Jewish culture. Good point. But I don't know, just interesting how critical we are of other people, whether we know that they're justified or not. You know, if they're justified, I think that we can disciple them. Mm-hmm. But if they're not, it's kind of hard to disciple somebody who doesn't have the gift of faith. I had uh, somebody shared an interesting perspective on that with me one time. They said that, I believe it was Philip, they said that um, discipleship almost starts, possi- possibly, not every time, but in some situations, almost starts before the saving faith happens. If you mm. And I think kind of the position he was coming from was was living out the teachings of Jesus in a way that impacts those around you, and uh, it can it can have an impact on somebody, and they can almost begin to want want what you have, and and eventually that can lead to their uh, being saved, and they will have the groundwork can potentially be laid at that point. I didn't articulate it nearly as well as he did. I didn't make it sound very clear, but I think you you get what what I'm trying to say. A person has to live out the teachings of Jesus as a believer Mm -hmm. in front of non-believers for, it seems, for a little bit of time before they'll trust that, 
this guy's the real McCoy or she's the real McCoy. It's just like, she's really a good person or she's maybe this or maybe that. There's no good, no, not one. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's just like the outside world does think that because they don't have the conformity to scripture to judge themselves on. Yeah. There's a, there's a song by Shalin. No, it's not by Shalin. Oh, I, beautiful I, eulogy. I tricked you. No, not by them either. Limp Biscuit. Hazakim. <laughs> oh, it's on the, <laughs> it, I wouldn't have guessed that one. It's on the, uh, uh, rhymes of the remnant playlist um oh. <laughs> but there's there's a yeah there's why is that funny to you i don't know <laughs> there's a yeah like that's a real thing it is a real thing yes it's, uh, it is it is not fictitious no there's a a certain they use a clip from a sermon where there's he's obviously from the south because he's got the like like tennessee region probably he's got that accent but he he says uh he's kind of talking like this and then he gets all excited and, and he says and but my father says there's no good, no, not one. And he says it, he says it just like that. The reason the good news is so good, we're all condemned deserters. You know what my heavenly father said? He said there is none good, no, not one. And so they they take that and they use that in the song in the chorus and he you know they, but anyway. This is but apart from the sacrifice for sin, there is no remission because there's none good, no. No, good, no, not one. So they, it, and obviously it's got a cadence to it, you know, so they kind of mix the beat with it. And, and uh, anytime they say that in the song, they play that clip instead of saying it. But anyway, good song. How's Akeem? It's called uh, No No One Good or anyway. It's on the playlist. So there was a little bit of a joke. It's, I don't know if it's going to fall into that dad joke category because mm-hmm. it's prompted here, but. A woman decides that it would be good to pay for her husband to have LASIK surgery. He has LASIK surgery, and a few days later, she is talking to her friend, and she says, you know, it was really a waste of money to spend $4,000 a night, and he still doesn't see the way that I see things. Uh, I get it. Kind of daddish joke, though, but at the same time, it's just like... Dad jokes are a little simpler. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit more... Elementary, my dear Watson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so today is Q and A, Q and A part two. We yeah. got the uh, fish bowl that's not a fish bowl. <laughs> it's a cookie jar. <laughs> it's a flower jar, actually, with all the questions in there. You want to draw first? Or do you want me to draw first? How many are we drawing? Uh, we're just going to go until time. Oh, time okay. Runs out. Uh, so pick a number between one and a thousand. Okay. What is it? 777. You go first. Odd numbers, you go first. Last time, you know what number you picked last time? 777. 666. Oh, did I? <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. yeah. I like triple digits. <clears throat> oh, man. Are you supposed to answer this or am I? We're both going to answer. Them. Okay. Yeah, we're both, we both just draw them because it's fun to draw the questions. Are the five solas of the Pro- Protestant Reformation essential to christian faith why or why not mm-hmm. so the five solas are um in english they are you are saved by grace alone through faith alone in christ alone according to scripture alone all to the glory of god alone so that is sola fide sola gratia Solus Christus, Sola Scriptura, and Soli Deo Gloria. Those are the five solas. That's, five solas. that's, in, that's Latin. Um, are they essential? I would say yes. Uh, they are essential to the faith. You don't have to know what they are to be a Christian, uh, but I think they're just a a uh, very well summarized. It's it, it's basically the gospel summarized into five parts. Where you're saved, you're saved by faith, uh, gr- by grace alone. The, it's the free gift of God uh, that we didn't earn through faith alone. Uh, which again, faith is a it's a gift. It's not by works, but it's by believing in Christ alone. Only in Christ, no one comes to the Father except through Him. According to Scripture alone, it is it's it's something that we get from Scripture. Um, uh, what's you know this verse better than I do? Um, how are they to be saved if they haven't heard and hearing from the word of God? I think I mixed two mixed up that a little bit, but 
According to Scripture alone, Scripture is the final authority, and all for the glory of God alone. It's not for our glory; it's all for for God's glory. So that that is that is the gospel, um, at least a, a part of it. Um, so I would say, yes, they are essential to the Christian faith, but no, you don't have to know what the five solas are to be saved. It's just it's a helpful. Uh, it's not an acronym. What would you call that? But anyway, yeah, I think that kind, of, you, an, kind of it could be an acronym. No, I guess it's if, not an acronym. So. Okay. An ac- acronym is is fat, faithful, available, yeah. teachable. Word. Yeah, I don't know what it'd be. I don't, know, I don't know what we'd call that. Is that your final answer? Yep. What's your What are your thoughts on the the five solas of the Protestant Reformation? Oh yeah, no, definitely. I think that uh, without without God's grace, I mean, we're all sinners and we don't deserve it. I mean, and all of our works are a bit filthy rags. So Mm -hmm. it's just like without God's grace and his gracefulness and his mercy, then he wouldn't, we wouldn't, you can't earn the gift of faith. So without his grace, you wouldn't get faith, which is a free gift given to us by the father because of his grace. And then the scripture, and that's faith in Christ alone. It's just like in the, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can't leave the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus out of the gospel or it's not the gospel. Right. So I think in Christ alone, um, and I think that the scripture is, you know, 2 Timothy 3.16, all all of the Bible is inspired by God for our becoming more like Jesus, for lack of a better term. That's changing a jot or a tittle. (laughs) But at the same time, you get what I'm saying. It's the entire thing, Old and New Testament. You you can't have the New Testament without the Old Testament. You can't have the New Testament without the Old Testament. You just said that twice. Well, that's what I meant. It was <laughs> yeah. it was emphasis. Yeah. Uh, and then I think that obviously the chief end of man is to glorify God and Him and, and to enjoy Him forever. So I would say that God's glory is the whole crux of it. The reason yeah. that we, during our sanctification process, make choices that we do should be either the motivation should be to glorify God. Is this going to be? Is this going to glorify God, or is this not going to glorify God? Yeah. And when you come to that, I think it's Deuteronomy thirty. It says, "I put before you life and death, in a sense, life and curses. Uh, choose life." Mm-hmm. So I think that life would be glorifying God. Um, I think that that kind of goes to the scripture: all things are permissible, not all things are beneficial. Um, if you wanted to have a glass of bourbon tonight, I think that that is permissible. You cannot lose your salvation over doing things like that. But would it be beneficial? Mm-hmm. Would it glorify God? Yeah. And uh, if it's going to be a stumbling block for somebody else or even yourself, if you have a problem with alcohol, that is not glorifying to God and you should abstain. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd say they're definitely, I mean, I don't think that they're the only things that are important no. to the Christian faith, but are those five things important to the Christian faith? Yes. Yeah. Um. And Shailen has a, a song with Timothy Brindle. <laughs> Imagine where, that. Where uh, they, it's a, I've heard this line in a few songs. I, I think they recycle a couple of lines, but this one was like Eminem songs, or huh? Oh. <laughs> huh? Okay. Eminem but, songs. I said Eminem songs. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where, you, what you're, but anyway. So, so Grace, they, it's uh, God's. It was, they, this was an acronym. It was God's, what was it? God's redemption? God's, what was it? I can't remember what the R stands for, but it's God's, like... What's the acronym? Grace. Oh. God's redemption or something, whatever the R is, at Christ's expense. Grace. Praise the Lord, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace. Yeah, the fine grace. Our redemption price immense. Grace stands for God's riches at Christ's yeah. expense. I- Basically, because of yeah, what it makes Christ sense, did, God's yeah. redemption at Christ's expense. It's not redemption. I can't remember what it is, but anyway, that reconciliation. Was, maybe that was restoration. It. Maybe a lot of good R words. Um, <sighs> next question. Do you have anything else to add on the five solos? Hmm. Nope. If uh, I'm not wearing it today, but in a lot of the older episodes, my black hoodie that I wear often, the five solos are on that little Easter egg for you all to go look at. <laughs> <laughs> little easter egg oh this is a good question Ooh, did jesus take on our sin nature it's not did jesus take on our sin did jesus take on our sin nature i'll let you start 
Let me think about that for a second. I would say no. I would say no. Because I mean, it, it, otherwise the, he would have been sinful. Right. Yeah, the sin nature is is what it's not what makes us sin. Um, okay, I almost said it's what causes us to be tempted to sin, but Jesus was tempted, and he didn't have the sin nature. I know for a fact Jesus did not take on our sin nature. I can say that confidently. I'm not confident. What's your it, scriptural fact? Um, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. He made him to be sin yeah. who knew no sin. Um. So the book that you talked about last week or two weeks ago, Chemistry of the Blood. Chemistry of the Blood. There, well, that had to do with the virgin birth more, I think. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, Psalm fifty one in my mother's in sin did my mother consume me? Uh, consume. What? She ate me. <laughs> what's the, what's the word? Conceive. In oh sin man. Did, <laughs> in, in, in sin she did. ate me with the man. Uh, uh, cannibalism is a sin. I did not so. know you were going there. Just Can, like, cannibalism is a sin. Is so. cannibalism sin? Uh, in sin did my mother conceive me. Um, we're okay. Here we go. So Adam, in Adam all die. Um, which is a scripture. I can't remember where Romans, I believe, but Romans seven maybe. But so you and I are. Uh, we receive we receive the curse of the sin nature because we are in Adam. Adam was our federal head. Adam was um, our representative in the garden, and through him, because of his sin, we likewise now have that sin nature. Christ, however, is not in Adam. Christ is the second Adam. He is he is outside of Adam, and he does not have a sin nature. That's the best I can do off the top of my head. I would say that he did not have the sin nature. He was, he was, he was human. He was truly God and truly man. But at the same time, he did not have an earthly father, right. which he could not have taken on the sin nature if he did not have an earthly father. He had a step daddy. He did, Joey. Joey. Not talked about a lot after Jesus's twelve-year-old experience. Yeah, I think uh, he kind of dropped the ball, and God, God got mad. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Second, after you let my boy go to the temple, and you were gone for a few days, you left him there. And Jesus, like, Jesus even stuck it to him. He's like, "Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house?" And did Jesus just fast for three days? Oh, I'm sure they had food in the temple. You're not supposed to eat the food in the temple. You know, around the temple. The same people that he whipped are probably the ones that fed him. <laughs> it's like, man, remember when this kid was 12 years old and we gave him that sandwich 18, of, eight, of 18 pita years and later. falafel? And just, 18 years later, he's whipping them. It's like, I gave you a sandwich. Oh, man. Yeah, so no, I do not believe that Jesus took on the sin nature. A lot of people... I agree. Um, now, he was made a little bit lower than the angels. That's human. Because human. Yeah. But he did not have an earthly father. And I believe, based on what I in the way that mm-hmm. I see scripture. <laughs> I know where you're going. Keep going. Go. The spermizo, sperm, spermazo. Is that, <laughs> is that where you're? <laughs> you dirty that's, it, that's what you were getting at. I know you were. I don't think that it's not possible. That he had the sin nature? Yeah. No, it's not possible. It's just like, I mean, without, without. I believe that the curse of the federal head Adam goes mm-hmm. through the sperm. Yeah, you've talked to and there's what's the Greek word? Spermatozoa. Spermatozoa, yeah. The which, mono- which is which is what in English? Sperm. Okay. That's where we get the word sperm. But the uh, that word's in scripture, isn't it? Sperm, yeah. sperm. Well, the the word's in Greek. It's in Greek. Uh so the monogene. Um when it looks like at the 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 firstborn of many. Mm-hmm. He's the monogene, so it's just like <clears throat> monogene means the first of his kind. Yeah, and it's just like so. I think that yeah, the uh, well, and also um, the reason the entire human race needs 
a savior is because we're born into the sin nature. Uh, we have this sin nature. That's why, you know, Romans, Romans 1, 18 through 20, we're, at, we're without excuse. Um, it's getting into election a little bit, but basically everybody is, because, so when you talk about predestination, there's the common argument of double predestination, which says, well, if God predestined some for heaven, that means he predestined everybody else for hell. It's like he actively sent these people to heaven and actively sent these people to hell where that's a little bit of a misunderstanding where in reality, we're, because of our sin nature and because of our sin, we're all headed for hell. And elect in the doctrine of election would say that God chose to elect some to save from that destination that, they're, that we're all already headed to. Whereas had, had Christ not died for us, let's say he just lived a perfect life and wasn't crucified uh, and then just eventually died, he would have gone to heaven. We would be out of luck, but he would have gone to heaven because he never sinned. Oh. So, no, I don't think he took on the sin nature. I agree. I think he took on sin. Mm-hmm. He, he who knew no sin, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Took on sin. It was a foe. What would you say to someone who still doubts his salvation after seeing its fruit in his life? Hmm. So the person has, this person has seen the fruit of their salvation in their own life, yet they still doubt their salvation. Well, first I would say that the Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. I can't give you the chapter and verse, but that is in there. Be a good Berean. Look it up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's uh, so a, a good piece of encouragement that I've heard from more than one pastor. If if you are if you are worried about whether you're saved or not, if you have that burden and you're concerned, like man, you're you're stressed about it, man. Am I am I really saved? That's a that in and of itself is evidence that the Holy Spirit is is in you, that you are concerned. A, a, a non-believer is not concerned about the things of God. A non-believer is not concerned about whether they're saved because they don't believe in it. But if somebody is is concerned, like man, am I am I saved? And you know, does God love me? Is am I truly? Do I truly have salvation? I think that's evidence in and of itself that there's 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 the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. Um, and I don't know, I think, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the devil's tactic is, um, to, con to basically steal, kill and destroy, to convince you that God doesn't love you, that you're not saved. I mean, all these things that are counter, uh, that go against what scripture says, all the things that God does and, and has, uh, all the things that God feels for his children and does for his children. You know, the devil tries to make you believe the opposite. So, again, not a great answer, but the best that I could come up with off the top of the head. Yeah, I think definitely it's, I mean, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, I think Romans 8. Mm -hmm. I would definitely point people to the, I, I think I would point people to the Gospels. I think I would personally, if a person is doubting their salvation, just for the simple reason, if a person is doubting their salvation and it's just like, you hear some people, it's just like, how do I know if I've committed the blasphemy against the whole Holy spirit, the unforg unforgivable sin, the unforgivable sin. <clears throat> and it's just like, man, if you're worried about that, you probably ain't committed it. Like you're saying, mm -hmm. because I think that if a person has committed the unforgivable sin, uh, they're obviously not saved. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so it's just like, if they're worried if they committed it, then they probably haven't committed it. Yeah. Um, I can't say unequivocally. I can't say factually based on the Bible, but I can kind of deduce that. Mm -hmm. But I would say, I would say I would go to the Gospels. I would stay in the teachings of Jesus for a person who doubts their faith, even though they see the evidence of the fruit. I would definitely, I would definitely go to the parable of soil if they saw fruit just because the good soil uh, would be that person yeah. because the other two never produce fruit. 
And then I guess the other three never produce fruit if you yeah. really want to get into it. But mm-hmm. the other two soils, the other one's a footpath. It's not really soil at all. It's like concrete. Rocks, gravel. Yeah, eh, definitely a, a well-trodden path. Yeah. But I would definitely go to the Gospels. I probably wouldn't go immediately to the book of Revelation. Well, and I think, too, um, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Mm-hmm. And if you see fruit in your life, of of obeying Christ, that's fruit that you love him. And John 15, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you. Yeah. You just have to, I think that you would have to use scripture. I mean, obviously. I think to pray. Like, I think there's, yeah. there are, yeah. there is, there is no feeling or situation or doubt that exists in human kind in mankind that there's not a psalm about not well let me rephrase that there's not an emotion i would say i would say that's probably i would say that's probably true there's a psalm that addresses every emotion in in mankind uh in the form of prayer i would say yeah so go to the psalms and pray yep next question next question it's kind of fun this is fun these are some of my favorite episodes this is a tough one. Great. What is the gospel? <laughs> I don't know. Good news. It, the is gospel. that good news? Is that good news? Huh? Is it say good news? What is the On gospel? Here? What is, is it just like is it just is the That's what the word gospel means. Good I know, news. but it's okay. I just want to make sure I answered the crush the question correctly. Christian. So the Christian. Christian. Why does Alex Trebek say question is and it, he gives the answer i don't know they have to what is the gospel that's an answer what is the what is the word for the truth about jesus christ what is the gospel what is the gospel the gospel is man it's uh this can be a 30 second answer or a 30 minute answer but the, <laughs> yeah no that's what i was like uh, <laughs> uh Philip has a had a good piece of advice uh, that I have not followed yet, but I I should, and and I think it's a very good piece of advice for everybody. He said you should have an elevator gospel, a sidewalk gospel, and a coffee shop gospel. Mm. So on an elevator, you got twenty seconds with the person. On the sidewalk, you might have two minutes. In a coffee shop, you might have thirty minutes. So you should have a, a gospel ready to go mm-hmm. to share. In an elevator when you got 20 seconds, on the sidewalk when you got a minute or two, and in a coffee shop when you have 30 minutes. So the elevator gospel is um, basically God created everything. God created the world and uh, mankind, and uh, Adam was the first man, and he sinned. He disobeyed God, and through him, we all now have the sin nature and are separated from God. And we could not fix that ourselves, so God took it upon himself to fix it, and he sent his son, who is God the Son, and he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, fulfilled the law, and died on our behalf because the wages of sin is death, so that that sin had to be paid for uh, because God is just, but he's also merciful, so he provided his son the perfect sacrifice to as a propitiation to satisfy the wrath of God on our behalf so that we may be reconciled to God. And when you believe in Jesus Christ and trust in him uh, for your salvation, you can have eternal life with God forever. Were you timing me? Mm -hmm. How would I do? How'd I get? 50 seconds. It's pretty good. Not bad. Mm -hmm. Not bad. It's a a tall elevator. Eh, depends. Yeah. It's maybe the elevator itself is not tall. Yeah. But you know what's annoying about the elevator gospel is every time somebody gets on, you got to start over. (laughs) That's <laughs> true. What if you're the guy that kind of watches the door in the elevator, and every time somebody got on, you told the gospel, <laughs> "You're you'd trapped." Be, you'd be good at it, man. You'd be good at it. Yeah, it'd be good practice. I, I mean, I think that you covered most of the points that I would probably highlight. Sin entered the world through Adam. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that I'm going to go more of the sidewalk gospel, and just kind of you may have two minutes. God gave one command in the garden, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. Mm -hmm. Uh, Satan, in the form of a serpent, 
deceived Eve. Adam was probably somewhere close by. Eve ate of the fruit, gave some to Adam. God had already promised that when you eat of it, you shall surely die. People try to argue the point, well, they didn't die that day. Yes, and I could kind of go back through Scripture, the day is but a thousand years unto the Lord. Methuselah was the oldest living person alive, 969 years. It's not a thousand years, so right. nobody's made it past a thousand. And then obviously there were all kinds of people who came along after Adam that had the sin nature. Some stood for the righteousness of God, but they were still sinners. Enoch. Enoch, good example. Elijah, another example. Mm -hmm. Both of those were actually translated, never actually died a physical death. It says it's appointed unto man who wants to die. The wages of sin is death. Yeah. So I think that you go on through, it's just like there was the promised Messiah, even in Genesis 3, that the seed of woman would basically war against the seed of the serpent, mm -hmm. and he would crush his head. And so basically what happened in on the cross, I mean, Jesus lived, came and lived, born of a virgin, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. And then what happens after that, he walks the earth for about 30 years, goes into public ministry, shares the kingdom, the kingdom of God with people for three years. Dies a sinless death, was never had any sin at all. Died some people say on a tree, uh, some people say on a cross. Anyways, he who hangs on a tree is cursed, according to Scripture. I think he died an actual physical death. He was not faking. He did not go into a coma. He actually died a physical death. His heart stopped beating. Mm -hmm. He was put into a tomb. He was there for three days, three nights, just like Jonah was in the belly of the whale or belly of the great fish for three days, three nights. On the third day, which was Sunday morning, he rose from the grave. He appeared to over 500 people after resurrecting from the dead, and then he ascended back to the right-hand side of the Father. Um, it is our responsibility as co-ministers in the Ministry of Reconciliation, as ambassadors of the kingdom, to share the good news that he came to set the captives free. And I think that the gospel is the good news. Mm -hmm. It's just like you can be free. Um there's so much more to it. Like you said, it could be a 30 minute. It's just like you can go through every single detail. The road to Emmaus, that's the one, that is the one conversation I would have loved to have been the fourth person on the road to Emmaus, walking for seven miles and him unpacking the scriptures yeah. to show himself in the Old Testament. Yeah. Here's where I was in the Old Testament. Here's where I was. Here's here's where I was when Melchizedek was here. Here's where I was when this, 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 this. It said their hearts burn. And I've never, I mean, I don't know if I've ever even experienced my heart burning. Maybe my <laughs> other parts of my body burning, but at the same time, it's just like, yeah, heartburn. Nausea, heartburn, indigestion. <laughs> Omeprazole, <laughs> Prevacid, <laughs> Zantac. So kind of a, a follow-up question is, uh, is there any... Is there any place in Scripture where it gives a clear presentation of the gospel? Um, so while you were talking, I thought of First uh, Peter three eighteen um, says, "For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit." That's like a super summarized version, but it leaves out some details. So, which made me think: Is there any clear presentation of the gospel the full gospel the the, the all the court de details are present mm. or do you have to take truths from without or uh, from different you know parts like it's, i know you could you yeah. could complete it from any of the four gospels but ephesians 3 is sometimes called the the mystery of the gospel revealed I think there's a couple of different places yeah. to where we kind of, but I think that you have to put it all together. Mm -hmm. Oh, picture page, picture page, picture. Next question. You know what we need? We need like a bingo thing. <laughs> I got one somewhere. I may have threw it away when I got it clean. You probably did. What does it mean to fear the Lord? Oh, that's a that's a hard question. I'm still learning that, I think. Um, 
there's a, a good book by, I believe it's by Thomas Watson. It's one of the Puritan paperbacks, one of those real short ones called The Fear of God. Um, Thomas Watson wrote The Doctrine of Repentance. Mm-hmm. It may have been, oh, it was John Bunyan, the guy that wrote Pilgrim's Progress. I think he was the one that wrote The Fear of God. But anyway, it's a Puritan paperback. If you just search that, you'll find it. The fear of God, well, the f- according to Scripture, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and, I believe, also the beginning of knowledge. It is. Um, I think the fear of God is is multi-layered. There is the side that we often emphasize, which is the reverence or respect for God. But I think there is also, uh, it's also important to uh, touch on actual fear of God. I mean... Um, when I was just reading this the other day in First Chronicles, when was it Solomon? No, it was David. When David became king, he wanted to go get the Ark of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, uh, back from the <laughs> Philistines. <laughs> and um, so they went and got it, but he did it kind of flippantly. He did it kind of. Just like let's walk in there and grab it, and we'll just carry it back really quick. And they were they had it riding on donkeys, I believe. Um, and it started they the donkeys hit like a you know pothole in the road or something, and it started to fall. And I can't remember his name, but one of the guys put his hand up and touched the ark to stabilize it, and God struck him dead. And it 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 actually it says that it made David angry, um, but it. You know, and then there's Ananias and Sapphira in in the New Testament in Acts, when they lied about the amount of money that they got from selling their land, and Ananias went first, and and he lied to Paul, and Paul said that he lied to the Holy Spirit. God struck him dead, and then his wife came later and didn't know that it, her husband was dead, and she said the same lie and struck her dead too. And I think God did those those things to instill a certain fear. I mean, I I think there's a, there's a healthy fear, not fear that like, if I sin, God's going to, you know, disown me and throw me into hell. But, but don't fear the one that can kill your body, but fear the one who can kill your body and send your soul to hell. I mean, there, there is, I think there's a place for fear. And I think a healthy reaction to that fear, not the reverence side, but the actual fear side, a healthy reaction to that fear is obedience. No, I don't think obe- I don't think that fear can maintain obedience, but I think that fear is a good reminder sometimes, uh, maybe a good starting point for some people. Um, you know, there's that question: Is it better to be feared or loved? And Michael Scott would say, "I want people to be afraid of how much they love me." <laughs> but I think it's both. I mean, I think you know, fear and, and love um, both are important. But what do you think? I don't know. I think that a lot of the the same things you just said, I would agree with those. I know that's kind of cliche to say, but I think that from a human perspective, it we have if if you're a good dad and a good mom, and you follow scripture that says that you're supposed to discipline your children, I think it is to create a a sense of respect or fear. Mm-hmm. And not not fear like they're going to kill me if I do something bad or they're going to beat me to where I'm not recognizable or they're going to yeah. really hurt me. Just going to paint your back portrait. But there's going to be discipline. Mm-hmm. I think it's, and this is probably a bad analogy, but I think it's the same way if you have a big German shepherd that you raise as a puppy. And when he starts to disobey, if you as the alpha discipline him early you may be able to sick him on other people but he's kind of afraid of you yeah and i think that that's kind of what you see in king david king david was dude he was i mean he was like seal team one Mm -hmm. maybe on steroids yeah i mean he's sneaking into camps and cutting off people's foreskin man it it in first chronicles it talks about the it calls them the strong men i think yeah the, the, the mighty men of david the, the mighty men of david man those guys dude it's just i don't know i'd never really paid attention to that or maybe i hadn't read it before but dude those guys were it kind of incredible the only depiction i've seen in movies that kind of snapped for me was troy 
I've never watched it. If you watch that, Troy kind of, if you can kind of put David in there at as Troy, yeah. and he had his, like, mighty men that surrounded him, they annihilated people. Yeah. And it's just like, that's kind of what David was. I've seen the fight scene a bunch of times on yeah. YouTube. When he I've fights never, Ajax. Yeah, but I've never watched the full movie. Yeah. It's a... But. But I think fear of the Lord is one of those things. I think that it can be reverential fear. I think it can mm-hmm. be a respectful fear. I think it's really, honestly, I think it gets to a point to where it's, it's love. And I, I, that's, I think that's the, the proper destination. Yeah. I think it, it has gotten to a point to me to where it's just like, it's really, uh, do I fear that he could zap me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he can. But I think it's when you move from slave to son or slave to daughter, I think it's very difficult to understand Scripture if you don't know that God loves you. Yeah, I would agree. And I think that that's where that fear resonates from. It's almost it becomes, I respect him so much because he loved me enough to choose me Mm -hmm. that I want to love him back and I'll lay down my life for him. And that may not necessarily be walking in front of a bullet. That may just be making decisions that would glorify him. Well, and two, you know, if you think about what did, what did Christ save us from? I'm asking you, what did Christ save us from? I mean, it says we're saved. What did we get saved from? From eternal destruction. Which is what? Separation from God. Why does that happen? Why does because the wages of sin is death? The wrath of God is what I'm getting at. Okay. It's the the hell is yeah. the eternal lake of fire is the wrath of God. Yeah. That's Christ was the propitiation. He satisfied the wrath of God on our behalf. So Christ, when we're when we talk about being saved, we're saved from God's anger. Yeah. And the, and it's I agree. So there's fear. We should fear God's anger. Romans eight one, there's now there's therefore now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. We don't have to fear that anymore. Right, right. But fear is an appropriate aspect of, of... Yeah, I think it's the, if you're in Christ, you should not fear the second death. Right. Which is the wrath of God or the condemnation mm-hmm. of God. Yeah. And it's just like, for there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Next question... Oh, this is a good one. John Piper would have some good things to say. Do you think that Christians long for heaven as they ought to? No. Elaborate. I think that we're so wrapped up in this world and what we can, the trappings of this flesh, that we don't even hardly ever think about heaven or eternity. Mm -hmm. Even if you, if you, if you're saying heaven, you know, tribulation, going to heaven, and then coming back to a new heavens and new earth, I would say we don't think about that near enough. If we did, I mean, then our motivations would be changed. We wouldn't set the goals that we set if we were thinking about heaven. We wouldn't be thinking about, honestly, I mean, I wonder sometimes, and I I know that this is very un-American, would we even ever take vacations? like destination, all-inclusive resort vacations if we were so focused on heaven. I, I don't see, I don't see anything in scripture yeah. that people would set that as a goal. I'm, I'm guilty. I set those as goals. I'm going to the beach in, yeah. in August, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to go catch some fish and I'm going to eat that fish and I'm going to, you know, play around on the, on the beach or whatever. But at the same time, it's just like, I think if we're focused on heaven, and I'm guilty. Uh, I see where you're coming from, and I agree. But I, I to to uh, throw you a bone or to kind of bail you out a little bit. I think enjoy him forever. That, but I th- I think too that um, you know where God God created things in a way that we en- God gave us taste buds. He didn't have to give us taste buds. Absolutely. We could have, we could have just eaten nothing but healthy foods for fuel and food and eating be a chore and not be, yeah. uh, you know, a, and sometimes a pleasurable experience, but so God, God allows us to enjoy things. And I think God, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with, oh. with enjoying those things, but 
it just comes down to stewardship principles. It's like mm-hmm. he says, store up not for yourself treasures here on earth, but yeah. store them up in heaven. I think it's the same thing. It's not a it's not a sin. That's what I was gonna Yeah, it's it's where your heart is. It's, yeah, it's it's not a sin. Right, yeah. But if you start to store them up for yourself, then I think that it becomes it can become sin. Yeah. And uh, so I, I started reading that book, um, Come Lord Jesus by John Piper, mm-hmm. where he talks about the second coming of Christ um, and how we should long for that. And he starts the book with Second Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me, award to me on that day. And not, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And he talks about how this crown of righteousness is going to be given to those who love the appearing of Christ. And then he makes the argument, it's very difficult to believe that someone is a Christian if they don't love the second coming of Christ, if they don't, if they don't long for that. Now, he does, I believe he does make an important distinction. There's a difference between new ignorant Christians or even old ignorant Christians and Christians who 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 now should know that Christ coming back is a good thing. I consider all things lost. Like I'm just I'm ready, you know, I'm I'm happy with the life that God has given me and I'm going to serve him the best that I can while I'm here and I'm not you know trying to be a downer. But ultimately this life is we live in a fallen world and I and I want Christ to come back to set us free. The creation groans for him to return and and to set set us free. So we ought to long for so I would I would rephrase the question a little bit do Christians long for the return of Christ as they ought to um do we long to be in God's presence as we ought to and I I I would say no we don't um and we should you know the the things of this world all the joys the greatest situation the greatest pleasures the greatest joys in this world are so small and insignificant compared to when we are fully reconciled to our creator and our father. And, and it's, yeah, it's, if we could meditate on that more, yeah. I think it would definitely shift our focus. Mm-hmm. And so it's obvious based on the condition of, and I'm just going to say condition of the country in which I live. Yeah. It's obvious that we don't think about heaven or God near enough. Yeah. If our lives were at <laughs> risk for, for, if our lives were at risk for following Christ, proclaiming Christ, we would long for heaven much more. Oh yeah. If, if you know, if it was, um, you know, I think about that movie, uh, silence, uh, mm. where it's about the first Catholic missionaries from Portugal who went to Japan in the 1400s, I think. And they're put your foot on it. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're, uh, being killed. Um, for basically uh, recanting Buddhism and, and embracing Christianity. And they, you know, I just think about that, being in that situation. It's like, man, that's the only thing I would think about is, please come back. Please yeah. come get us, Jesus. Especially if you knew it was a possibility. If you knew it was a possibility, you'd focus so much more on it. But I think that people have almost lost sight that, ah, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, I mean, and we're so, I think America's the is the we are most susceptible to being the weedy soil. I would say weedy. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. Or is that the thorns? It's the same. There's rocky soil. That's what it is, the rock, yeah. I always, I always get the rocky soil and the rocky path mixed up. Yeah, the weedy soil. Next question. How can the average Christian serve the Lord? Oh, man. How can the average Christian serve the Lord? First, what's the what's the greatest commandment? Love God, love others. Yeah, love love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love others. Love your neighbor as yourself. So I think first of all, uh, the whole law is fulfilled in these. So I think loving your neighbor is um, is the the uh, I don't know I can't find the word not the quickest way but it's the most direct way. Um, Serving? I don't know. Give me some thoughts. Give. I'm. I'm having trouble here. 
what can an average Christian do to serve the Lord? Yeah, how can an average Christian a, serve the Lord? That was, was that the question? Yeah, I may read it again. Make sure I read it right. Yep, serve the Lord. That's it. Yeah, I would say definitely um, finding areas to serve. I would say a lot of people are going to argue with this, but I would say that getting involved with a local congregation that actually holds to, if at all possible, the five solas. And I think that ministry opportunities will present themselves. Um, I don't think you need to go in there expecting to be the teacher next Sunday. I think you need to go in there and get plugged in and, and then just as the Lord directs, directs. And I think that, I think you need good. I think it, the average Christ, the average Christian, if they haven't been regularly practicing service, need to have mentors. Yeah, I think mentors. Are I think mentors would be important uh, because I think that you can learn from their experiences, good and bad. And good mentors will tell you about their bad experiences as well as their good experiences. And they'll tell you, here's the lesson I learned based on scripture not to do this ever again. And it could be even, you know, you know, I, I cheated on my wife. And here's why you can't do that according to scripture. So you need to keep fidelity uh, within your marriage. Because I think that serve the Lord, it's not, I think that sometimes it's just starting with the people in your family. Yeah. And because I think that they are others, I think I don't. It's never really been my jam to stand on street corners, and that's just not my gig. Yeah. Um, there's there's Todd Friel does a good job at that. He's the guy from Wretched Radio. Mm. He he does a good job at that. He, I think he goes to like college campuses and stuff. But like I like I, and I'm not ragging on him or anything. But recently on the corner of Zero. Zero and 71, which turns into, mm -hmm. what is that, 24th or right there at Walmart? Mm -hmm. There was, there's a group, I don't know, I, I don't think they were Mormons. They all had the white shirts on, long sleeve shirts, but uh, was that Church of God or Assembly? Not or Assembly. They're, but, they're Baptist, I think, most but, of those. Anyway, and they, you know, everything they were saying was true, but People are driving by. They're it, at most they're going to be stopped at that light for sixty seconds, and you know somebody may somebody may may have their window down, and and God may they may hear a portion of the scripture that God just you know yeah boom captures their heart. But but it, you know is that really effective? Is the, is that what's the word I'm looking? Is that really efficient? And I don't know. Is efficiency something you should look for in serving the Lord? Maybe I don't know. But there's been so many times where it's just like people intentionally are doing things that are perceived as good for people so they can share the gospel with them. I just feel like it's a little fake, a little phony at times. I'm, yeah. I'm totally cool with it. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you should be doing the good work for just the mere fact of doing the good work. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, Jeff, don't have an agenda. Yeah. And like Jeff Durbin and, um, uh, his church, Apologia Church in, I'm not sure what city, but somewhere in Arizona, they, they stand outside a lot of abortion clinics and, uh, they don't do a whole lot of yelling and stuff. A lot of times they'll just stand there with signs and like talk to people that walk by and, you know, and they share stories of, of young women who were headed into the clinic to get an abortion and, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, chose not to, and some who even chose not to and received Christ. But so I think there's a place for it. I don't think it's, I don't think it's bad, but anyway. Yeah. I think it can be just whatever the Holy spirit opens up to you as an opportunity. Yeah. I think you, I mean, you should be taking the light with you. And man, you got, if you're going to do that, you got to be on your game. Like Todd Friel, the wretched radio guy on, on those college campuses, he gets into discussions sometimes and they'll ask him a question or like challenge him on something. And in, in my head, I'm like, Oh man, how's he going to answer that? And he's just, he's got it. And obviously that's the Holy spirit, but it's also a lot of him, you know, feeding his brain and his heart with the word so that it's there. Oh, yeah. But the, you know, that's his call. You're, so. you're not gonna, you're not gonna read the verse of the day 
and you know four days a week and then go out there and be able to answer questions on the spot it's just it doesn't happen like that uh-uh. oh this is a good question oh man is it okay to have images or depictions of christ so i think where this question is coming from is like pictures in your home paintings in your home or uh you know in movies and tv shows where they they um there's an actor who plays jesus uh there's a and this is a this is of all of the discussions that happen within christianity this is a fairly lighthearted one but there is a, a discussion between two camps of is that violating the second graven image? Yeah. The second commandment don't have a graven image. Mm -hmm. Um, is that a golden calf? So to speak, uh, having an image of Christ. Um, so like in some movies, I believe it, there was the, the gospel of Luke or the gospel of John, a movie that was made like the sixties or the seventies where the person who played Jesus, they only ever showed the back of him. They never showed his face, Hmm. um, because of that, because of the second commandment. So, so is it okay to have images or depictions of Christ? I think that we know for a fact that every image or depiction you have of Christ is a false image. Right. So we have to start with that being the basis of, of that particular question. No one knows what Jesus looked like. Mm-hmm. So any picture that you make of him is not going to look like him. So I think that, I think it teeters on breaking the second commandment, which is having a graven image. Uh, it would be better not to. Mm-hmm. I think that you would be better. It, like I think probably, even though crosses are, you know, obviously the cross is depicted as an instrument of torture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of. <laughs> it's like it's, it's like well, walking say, around with an electric chair. Yeah, exactly. Death row records. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just <laughs> yeah. like. So I think that with that being said, it's a. Um, Oh, it would probably be better not to, yeah. being honest with you. I think just kind of the same thing. It's just like there's there's liberty in that. That's one of the things that Jesus came to purchase was liberty. You know, I think that liberty in the form of, you know, it's just like if you see something in Scripture and you're convicted by it through the Holy Spirit that you shouldn't do it, then that's work out your salvation through fear and trembling. I think that oh, yeah, this be, is be fully convinced. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, do you worship on Saturday? Do you worship on Sunday? Do you eat meat? Do you not eat meat? You worship every day, Kyle. And scripture actually calls vegetarians weak. Yeah. I it know. does. I know. It's just like, and it's, I mean, somebody's going to say, no, it doesn't. I'm going to find it. Keep talking. I'm going to find it. Well, I think that it, <clears throat> something definitely changed in, in man after the fall. Cause they were definitely vegetarians prior to, but at the same time afterwards, it's like they became, they became omnivores. Yeah. They they definitely didn't become solely carnivore and they were not herbivores anymore. Romans fourteen one. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Romans fourteen two. <laughs> <laughs> So the graven image thing, or basically having images of Jesus. Yeah. I guess, I mean, I guess to each their own, but I mean. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you that uh, that's one of the things that Christ came to to um, accomplish for us was give us liberty. But if it is, because the argument on the one side is that it's breaking the second commandment and Christ did not purchase us liberty to break the Ten Commandments. No, absolutely. So if it is breaking the Ten Commandments or the second commandment, not all 10 of them, but if you broke one, you've broken them all. You'd probably be better off not to have them than have them. Yeah. Yeah. And two, if you, you know, if you, uh, um, scripture gives descriptions of Christ, not physical descriptions, but of who he is. And like, there was, there's a movie that I watched. Um, I think it's called risen where it's the starts at the crucifixion. So it's the crucifixion it is called risen. through the ascension of Christ, through the eyes of a Roman soldier. And there's, yeah. there's an actor who plays Jesus who also mm-hmm. played uh, one of the Mexican gangsters in training day, believe it or not. Hmm. But he, um, there's like a scene in the movie where he, um, this, this Roman soldier is like following the Christ and his disciples after the crucif- after, after Christ has been raised from the dead and he's kind of following them from a distance and trying to figure out what's going on. Cause he was there at the crucifixion and then he saw Jesus alive again. So he's like trying to figure out what's going on. 
and there's a scene where it's nighttime and he's kind of up on a cliff away from them. They're down by the campfire and Jesus approaches him and has this private conversation with him. And I can't remember anything that he says, but I remember thinking like, man, it would be so cool just to like sit underneath the stars and have like a private conversation with Mm -hmm. Jesus like that. But for a long time, for a few months after I watched that movie, every time I thought about Jesus, I pictured that dude's face who also plays a Mexican gangster in training day. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it was kind of, it's not, it's not the picture of Jesus the scripture. Uh, <laughs> no, pains, but anyway, how can I talk about the existence of God with someone who refuses to listen to the Bible or doesn't believe the Bible is reliable or true? That's a tough question. Well, so first of all, you should. I think there's a now here. I'm going to say what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to explain myself a little bit. So you should try to do it without using scripture. Now, what I mean by that is you can use scripture. Just don't say, well, in Matthew 3.16, it says, da, 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 da. just say what it says without telling him the verse in the chapter. Um, I learned that from Vody Bauckham's book, Tactics, how to, how to, uh, how to practice apologetics. Hmm. Um, That's a good point. But it, so Romans, Romans 1 basically says that there's no such thing as an atheist, that every man, every man, every human knows that God exists. They know that there's a God. They know that, um, you know, because um, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been uh, revealed ever since the creation of the world. Um, And it is plain to them because God has shown it to them, but they suppress it because of their unrighteousness. So, everybody knows that there is a God. Uh, Psalm 19, the heavens declare the the glory of God, you know, that nature is an, is a, is evidence that God exists. So you're, you, if that feels like a really, really tough conversation to have, how do you, how do you talk about the existence of God with somebody who doesn't believe that the Bible is true, but we're starting off at an advantage within our hearts, within every human born and unborn Christian and unchristian God has planted within us the fact that there is a God. We all know that God exists, whether we say that we believe in him, in him or not. So we start off in an advantage. You just have to get to that in that person. That's the hard part. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I think you can't do it without having a relationship with that person. I don't yeah. think on, on the street, this is the first and last time you're going to talk to this person. You're, you're It's going to be tough. You're going to have to... You can't do it without scripture. You have to do it with scripture. But I think using Bodie Bauckham's tactic of don't don't tell him you're using scripture. Just use scripture as yeah. as if you're just talking, you know. I think definitely kind of like what we talked about this morning. And I think that I think that I'm pretty decent at this as far as finding common ground with people just because I practice it for such a long period of time. It's just just start with questions. People answer questions. Mm-hmm. And you don't make it just overly invasive, but at the same time, it's just like you can. And I think that that will be apparent in that conversation. How, how invasive can you be? You know, what are you doing now? What are you, what are you doing for work now? You know, just kind of, and then going into those conversations, because if you live in and around the same area and you don't know this person, there is going to be what they call a concentric circle. So you're going to, their two circles are going to intersect at some point in time. Venn diagram. Yeah. So I think that when that happens, then you highlight that point, find common ground, and a memory then comes from that common ground. And I think that that's when that's when you can kind of throw, that's when you can kind of throw scripture out there without quoting scripture, but you got to know scripture. Yeah. You got to know scripture. And that's why it's so important. If you really care about a lost and dying world, you would know scripture because if you don't know scripture, you're not sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. You're just sharing what you're calling love. And there's a difference between you just loving people and you actually sharing the gospel. So I think that we must know the scripture. Now, it's obviously a good thing to show love. I mean, give a person a cup of cold water to your enemies, and it'll be like pouring coals of fire on their head. There's just so many different places in scripture where it tells you to do good things. It's just like if somebody's hungry, you know, don't just say, I'll pray for you. 
uh, be warm and well fed, give them something to eat, give them some clothes, you know, go the extra mile. Jesus would say, if a Roman soldier compels you to go one mile, you go two, proving that you're my disciple. Uh, this is how they would know you're my disciples by your love one for another. I think that that kind of goes without saying that we do those things, but I think it kind of gets to the point. And there are some extra biblical texts, uh, such as, you know, we've alluded to the chemistry of the blood and different things, and you can start to have conversations. But sometimes things like that will take you into a rabbit hole. Yeah. And you got to be careful with rabbit holes, especially depending on the situation. I've gone into rabbit holes with with drunk people, rabbit holes with people who are high on substances, and it doesn't seem to help them. Well, yeah, not at all. It doesn't seem to help them. Mm -hmm. It just kind of goes into more argumentative, and it's just like, and then it's just like, and it just, so I think that be careful with that. But if you can use scripture, I think that, um, you know, you can use just little snippets you know, iron sharpens iron. You can use little snippets or basically just little passages of the scripture that you know that you can just kind of drop those little bits of word. Um, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Uh, the, somebody will say, I feel so alone. Well, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's the only one that'll never leave us. Humans will. And uh, Yeah, I mean, if that person's a believer, if, if they're a non-believer, that doesn't apply to them. It doesn't, but at the same time, it's just like, People who hear the gospel for the first time aren't believers. Well, yeah, but that, you know, the, the way that question was phrased was if somebody doesn't. So this person are, is is mm -hmm. actively disagreeing on purpose with the Bible. So Yeah, what, how did that work? They don't believe in the reliability of the Bible, right? That was part of it. I think it was kind of too twofold. <sighs> how can I talk about the existence of God with someone who refuses to listen to the Bible? Refuses to listen to it, yeah. Or doesn't believe the Bible is reliable or true. Mm -hmm. The existence of God. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think you answered better on that one. Uh, well, it's like uh, Stephen Lawson. You know, I didn't really understand the question, but I had a great answer. <laughs> you ever heard Bane? You you watch uh, Bane? Oh, yeah. Batman? Yeah. It, I love his voice. Yeah, what's, what's, the, what's a quote that he says? He's... Uh, there's, there's a, there's a, there, <laughs> you sound you sounded like Robocop malfunctioning. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some new. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of a quote that he says to Batman. It's been a long time. I need to watch that again. It's been a long time since I've watched that. You know, maybe two movies I, I want to watch again that I've thought a couple of times about recently Napoleon Dynamite and Nacho Libre. Both of those are. Yeah. Now, so when I went to Beautiful Feet, which was my missions training and sending organization. Whenever I went through the training, we would have a movie night where Eric Guthrie, the director, he would pick a movie that somehow related to missions. And then we would, so we'd watch the movie and then we kind of talk about what principle about missions that that, you know, spoke of. And the last one that we watched, which was, which is his favorite movie of all time by far is Nacho Libre. <laughs> and it, it's see why you go to Guatemala watching Nacho Libre. <laughs> so this is your mission. Become a professional wrestler. <laughs> Uh, what would you say to someone who is not a Christian? That can't be, that had to have gotten cut in half. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to someone who's not a Christian? Repent and believe in the gospel. That's good. Let's do another one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, oh, this is a good question. Oh, okay. What were the attributes of Jesus that drew sinners to him? Or another way to say it, what were the characteristics of Jesus that attracted sinners to him? I think uh, I think one of them was, you know, there's the verse that says um, he did not, the righteous do not need to, the righteous. Oh. Don't need a physician. Yeah, the healthy don't need a physician, but the Those sick Those who are do. well don't need a physician. <clears throat> so I think, it, I think it, people could tell, people could see in Christ that he really was there to heal in every sense of the word, that he really did care about him. I think that's a big one that he he really did love them. Like like Jesus, you know, we're supposed to do this and it's I do a bad job at this, but Jesus obviously did the best job at this of 
looking at a dying, lost and dying world and having a burden for them. Like Jesus really did hurt that people did not know God and he like really cared. And, and, and I think people could perceive that in him that, man, this guy, even if I disagree with him or if I'm, you know, the rich young ruler, even, even if I'm going to walk away, I'm going to not give up what I should give up. I can still tell that, man, this guy really does care about me. I think that was a part of it. Yeah, it was almost, I think that don't necessarily have to be careful with it today, but I really feel like Jesus was very accepting. I don't think he was necessarily, he wasn't tolerant, and there's a difference between tolerance and acceptance. But he accepted people who had probably been rejected by religion at that time. Yeah, I see, yeah, no, I see what you're saying, and I I think it's accurate though. But, but I, you're right. We it, we do need to be careful with that tolerance and acceptance. There's right? a difference between acceptance and tolerance, mm-hmm. and I think he accepted them, but he always told them, "Go and sin no more." Yeah, exactly. And he accepted them. He says, "You can do this. I will and have set you free. Yeah. But if you get back into this, seven more deadly spirits." than the one I just cast out of you are potentially going to come and invade your space. Mm-hmm. So I think that he was full of warning, you know, be watchful of the leaven of the Pharisees. I think that there were probably a lot of people who were rejected, who probably were predestined, uh, whether it be Matthew, who probably was rejected by Judaism because he was a tax collector. But God the Father saw fit for him to be chosen as one of the 12 apostles. I mean, Jesus went up into the mountain to pray all night before he made the selection. So God obviously gave him the download on who he should select. I mean, because he didn't do anything that he didn't hear the Father do or say. Yeah. You know, so I think that, I mean, even Judas, I mean, there was a, there's a difference between acceptance and tolerance. Acceptance is basically, and this is kind of hard for some people, I think when you especially get into church leadership, dude, you can come to church here anytime you want. You can fellowship with us, but if you're still practicing whatever sin it is that besets you and everybody knows it, I mean, if you keep it a secret, I mean, nobody knows except God. But if somebody comes up with the information of your particular sin, you're practicing it, there's no way that we can in good conscience allow you to be in leadership. I mean, there's just a difference. Please come here. Go through the the restoration process. To- well, and I, th- I think, t- I mean, there's, there too, there is a place for church discipline. You know, if, if, well, yeah. if somebody is sinning, then approach them. And if they don't listen to you, take a, take another witness. And if they still don't listen, you take them to the church leadership. And if they still don't listen, turn them over to Satan, turn them over to Satan, treat them as a non-believer. <laughs> That's what it says in the Bible. Mm-hmm. That's harsh to a lot of people who may be listening on this, but at the same time, it's just like the name of the podcast is pondering the pages. Pages we're, of scripture. Yeah. We're trying to understand what it says and trying to live it out. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I fail at it miserably daily but at the same time it's just like i know what it says about church discipline and that's the hard part Mm -hmm. especially being in leadership yeah because you want to just kind of like oh he'll get it yeah you want the person to stop like to go and sin no more you want them but you know yeah c'est la vie next question c'est la vie what does that mean that's life oh i think it's french what advice would you give to a young Christian? Read your Bible, like seriously. S- store it up in your heart, like bury scripture in your heart, memorize it, memorize scripture. I think that's one of the, like, you know, Hebrews, what is it, 4.12. Um, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God it's it's how you do spiritual warfare it is how you know who god is it's how you learn more about god and who he is and who we are and and how we relate to god it's how you learn who christ was on this earth and how to be more like him i mean scripture is 
is everything. So memorize scripture. Spend a ton of time and effort memorizing scripture, I think is the the first piece of advice I would give a young Christian. Which I'm giving that to myself. I still am a young Christian and I'm I need to do that more. I'm working on it though. I think I'm at uh on the on I'll give a quick recommendation here to an app called Bible Memory where it helps you memorize verses. I'm at 89 verses right now. That's a pretty good, uh, that's been a pretty good app for you, hasn't it? Yeah. Philip recommended that to me years ago, probably 2014, I think. So getting going on 10 years ago and, um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I couldn't spout them all off right now in a row, but they're in there so that the Holy Spirit can, has a pool to draw from. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would say I would say scripture would be number one for me. That would be number one. Number two would be if you're a female, find an older female that is not a young Christian. What if you're a male? You find an older male. Oh, okay. Or, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> I think that, you know, that it's pretty clear in scripture that if you are a the older women are supposed to give advice and instruction to the younger women. I don't think that as a young Christian, if you're a young female Christian, I don't think that you should seek an older male as a mentor. I think it, it unless sets it's, you, unless it's your dad. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, but in, in ministry, I think that it's one of those where it's just like it sets you guys both up for too much temptation. Yeah, uh, because the other one is in spiritual authority. You're putting mm-hmm. them in a spiritual authority place, and unfortunately, the sin nature exists, and they can abuse that. Well, and and not even that. Well, like on top of that, even if even if that wasn't an issue, accusations from outside and yeah. things like that that can that and can emotional happen. attachments yeah happen. Yeah. Um, so it may not even be a. Uh, it may not even be a sexual thing that happens, but there can be some unhealthy emotional attachments that happen there. Um, so I would say, number one, scripture. Number two, find a find a mentor. That's what. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, find a mentor, and number three, drink a lot of water. Hmm. <laughs> that's coming from and the, coffee. That's coming from the medical side. That's a good question. Is that yours? Yeah. You draw that. Next question. Oh, the Psalms ask God to defeat his enemies. Why don't we pray that way today? The Psalms ask God to defeat his enemies. Why don't we pray that way today? I think in our context, we are so oblivious to the spiritual warfare going on. And not, I'm not even talking about like the the demon possessions and things. I'm just talking about the day-to-day temptations that happen, um, just the small things. You know, when, when uh, you got home, you've had dinner, kind of got an hour or two to end the day. Do you read scripture or do you watch TV? Just those little things, those little mm-hmm. small decisions. Um. I think we're just oblivious to that spiritual warfare. I agree with that. I probably, just being honest, I probably, I don't ever do that. Yeah, I don't I don't either. So I need to, I think that this is kind of correction for me. It's just like, maybe I need to. Or has, through what Christ did, already defeated all my enemies? Mm-hmm. In an ultimate sense, yes, but in a practical sense right now. Yeah. Mm. The victory has been won, but the battle is still going on. Yeah. Well, I think that after after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you know, the book of Ephesians was written, you're not fighting against flesh and blood, but the powers and principalities in the heavenly places. Yeah. So I think that that would mean that we're still fighting a cosmic battle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's one of those things, we're really not fighting the cosmic battle. There's somebody that's fighting the cosmic battle for us. Mm. Um we just have to get in alignment with the person that's fighting the cosmic battle. Because the only way that we can war is by blocking darts and using the word. Uh, but it's greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. I can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. 
Because when you start trying to go and fight the enemy without Christ, you're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, I I would disagree with the semantics on your first sentence that we're not fighting the battle that that God's fighting it for us. We just have to, and I think we are fighting the battle. Yeah, I think it's what Ephesians said. Yeah, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but the powers and principalities. But we are fighting against the. Power. Yeah, we are. Yeah, but I think that we have to take the position of. I'm I'm just well, you use I'm just word. a vessel. Yeah, you use the word. Yeah, I'm just a vessel. Yeah, you're not we're not fighting by our own uh effort or intelligence. Use the word as your as your sword. Yeah, That's your it's definitely. Yeah. You know, it's just like I think that it's kind of like the memorization of scripture. It's just like that you may not always have a Bible in hand. Yeah. When when those opportunities arise, you may not always have your cell phone. Your cell phone may be dead. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, I can't fight. I don't have my cell phone. Yeah. It's just like, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. My cell phone's dead right now. Is it? Yeah, it died. It, mm-hmm. It's dead. Last question. Oh. We'll, we'll do one more. One more question. How do I grow in my trust in God when I am struggling to trust him? How do I grow in my trust in God when I'm struggling to trust him? It's a weird question. No, it's not. You probably wrote that yourself. These are all from Ligonier.com. Oh. I didn't I didn't uh, write any of these. I would say that scripture. I think just get into get into the habit of renewing your mind daily. It will grow. Yeah. I trust it. It has worked for me. That's the only thing I can go on is experience. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so one, you can look at how God has come through for all of the different people in scripture. Um, and then you can use the scriptures about God and his character and and who he is and, um, take those promises. I think prayer is a big one. Ask God all of these questions about like, what if I'm doubting my faith? How do I trust in God? These things, these internal struggles that we have, I think prayer is a is a big part of all of those. Um, asking God to to work in you. I don't think there's a formula where we can do step one, step two, and step three, and now all of a sudden I trust in God. I think um, I think it's the work of the Holy Spirit in us to to draw us to God and to give us those that assurance uh and and trust in cuz i mean all the, when you trust in god it's just like when you trust in anybody you're trusting in their character if somebody uh if somebody lies to you and you figure out that they lied to you you no longer trust in their character because you, they're a liar but when you learn about the character and attributes of god and you know that god is truth not only does he tell the truth always but he is truth when you learn about the attributes of God, the character of God, you you learn you grow in your trust and your faith in Him because of who He is, not because of anything that you've done, or because you've earned His favor or anything like that. Just because of who He is, the more you know about who God is, the more you can trust Him because He's God. He, you know, it's just. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I think that it has to come through. You know, renewing your mind daily. The Word will not come back void. Mm-hmm. I think it's important for a person who's battling with trust issues trusting God. I think forsake not the assembling of yourselves together because you need to be around people who do trust God. And I know this sounds maybe ridiculous to people who, but it really is simplistic like this. When you get around people who trust God and you see the will of God happening in their life, you kind of desire it. Yeah. And then it's just like, okay, well, I'm going to try that. Um, I'm going to try praying or I'm going to try, you know, it's just like, this is, you know, sometimes for different people, this could be a little bit weird. I'm going to try a fast or I'm going to try this because such and such did it. And he got results with that. I think that by trying things, you're basically, you're basically saying, God, I, I, I desire more of you. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, and he knows that yeah. he knows that. So if it, if the intent of your heart is truly desiring God, then he will, I man, I just, I yeah. just believe he will show up. Yeah, I do too. And it's just like, he, he's a good, good father. 
It's like, and I think that it says that too many times in Scripture, and I think that... Well, Chris Tomlin said that. Yeah. Well, well thanks for hanging out on the porch with us for a while and pondering the pages. <laughs> that what? That's what it says. That's what you think. Yeah, you're right. That's what it says. Um, well, we'll see y'all next time. See you next time. See you next time. Play us out there, old Kyle. <laughs>